Okay, welcome. I just want to say it's great to see everybody and see your faces and whoever else can join with their faces. It's always nice to see you're smiling, you're nodding, your thumbs up, you know, as much participation, unmute yourself. I'm not going to really check, check the chats unless, you know, I have a moment, but go ahead and jump in or wave at me, hopefully. And I just want to say a special hello to Jen, because Jen lives, um, goes to classes with my friend in her Chabad community and Nancy brought her on Zoom to this class. So that's really exciting for me. So welcome. Welcome to the Rosh Chodesh Society to our newest course, Code to Joy. And we're going to explore the wisdom of Judaism as it pertains to enhancing our joy and happiness. So some of you might've heard me tell this story. Growing up, this was my father's version of a joke. There were two boys, twins, and one of the boys was, I see a few people smiling. You've heard me tell this story. Okay. So one of the boys was just perpetually happy. Like everything was fine with him and he was comfortable in his skin and he was smiling and laughing. And then the other one, and this is why the parents kind of were able to compare them is because they were twins and they had this kid that was always so joyful. And there was another child who everything was just the worst. Like he found the worst in every situation. He was a, a you know, the eternal pessimist and nothing was good enough. And if he got this, well, why didn't he get that? And this one got that. And, you know, we had a fun day, but it could have been funner. And last time it was better and he had a better time. So the parents took their sons to a psychologist and the psychologist decided to do a, um, uh, uh, what's it called on them? A little test on them. So they put one, they took the boys and they put one of them, the eternally happy child, the optimist, and they put him in a room full of manure. And then they put the boy that was always sad in a room full of toys and they, you know, behind a one-way mirror and they figured like, let's see how they react to this situation. Okay. We're going to, we're going to get one boy down and we're going to get one boy up and we're going to have an equilibrium here. So a few hours later, they come into the room of the sad, pessimistic child and he's in a room full of every kind of toy and electronic and there's everything there. I mean, he has potential to enjoy his few hours. Maybe he's 11. And they open the door and he's just sitting there moping. And he's like, and nothing in the room has been touched. And they are like, Benji, what's up? Like, you had all these amazing toys. What's wrong? He's like, I knew you're going to take it away anyway. And he just it was miserable. He couldn't even enjoy himself. And then, you know, they're wondering, what are they going to see in this room full, filled with manure? They, you know, open the door and flying at them comes a splat of manure on somebody's shoe, on somebody's face, on somebody's shoulder. And the psychologist is like, you look so excited. What's going on? He's like, oh, there's got to be a horse in here somewhere. So um, that is the eternal optimist and the eternal pessimist. It doesn't matter what situation you give them. These are people that know how to dig their heels in and whatever their natural inclination is. Um, so we all have an opportunity to make choices, to uplift our attitude. Um, now this series, series on joy, it actually took me a few minutes to really connect because many of us think I'm pretty I'm a pretty joyous person. I'm pretty happy go lucky. You know, I have my moments. And so this is not a series about, you know, clinical depression or eternal sadness, but it's, it's a, it's an, it's a series to see how we can up our joy. Like, let's see how we can enhance it because what we're going to learn about joy, I'm telling you, you're going to want to just enhance that and find new ways to be more joyful and um, just get more out of that in life. So, um, so, okay, so joy, so it's a series, it's seven classes and each class is standalone because you cannot expect to learn about joy in one class and like change on a dime. Maybe from this class, you'll learn one thing to change and that will change something about how you're looking at things. 
but we're just, what we're here to do each week, and as I said, each week is a standalone class, we're here to deepen our understanding and the different angles and aspects of how to bring more joy into our life. So hopefully after seven months, we'll have tools to be more consistently joyous. And I just also for a second, I really want to normalize kind of um, our status quo, right? Um, it's called normal, okay? So we want to go north of normal, right? North of normal would be the more joy we get, but, um, but neutral, I'm sorry, not neutral, not normal, neutral. So we, if we're at neutral, we can go in many different directions. And I want to normalize, that's where I got the word normal from. I want to normalize that fear, anxiety, listlessness, sadness. I'm not, when we're talking about joy, we're not just talking, um, depression, we're not just talking about a lack of, 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 happiness is more than the absence of depression. Okay. So if you're not depressed, it doesn't mean you're necessarily joyous because I, I would imagine many of us here will suffer from some kind of depression and many of us do not. But just because you're not depressed doesn't either mean that you're joyful or joyous or living your optimal self in the joyful part. So, um, so we have this, um, the normal state of being is that anxiety comes at us, right? And our reptilian brain, which is the oldest brain we have, which is our most undeveloped brain, it's the brain we get when we are born, when things come at us like sadness or fear or anxiety, that's normal. That happens to all of us. And what that's doing when those things come at us, they're little messages saying, hey, watch out, beware, something to think about, something to um, solve, a problem. You know, once upon a time, maybe, you know, a tiger was coming our way. So fear was a good thing. We were going to get out of, away from what was going to attack us. Nowadays, I would say anxiety comes our way. So we can either look at it as like something that's a sign. Okay, I'm noticing it. And then where do we go from there? So the question is, do we take that anxiety and sit and worry about it and think about it? And it causes us to spiral into this sad, worried, angry, fearful place? Or do we recognize it and say, hmm, this is interesting. And what is happening as opposed of this, as, uh, because of this? So we're not meant, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the things that um, the neutral spaces that we find ourselves in, we're not meant to stay there. And we're not either meant to get dragged down with it, okay? So, um, so much of Hasidus and so much of what I study every day, Tanya, and, and just so much of what I've taught is, is practically bringing this into life. So this is actually really exciting to teach again, but it's really, really hard work. Like staying north of neutral is getting more and more and more north of neutral and having better tools to get yourself out to, to recognize that anxiety and recognize that fear and recognize the worry and not falling into a spiral with it, this is hard work. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. It's, this is, I think, one of barring mental health issues. You know, if we are functioning like every human being, this is life's biggest struggle. Even when we are, you know, all of our chemicals are in balance and we are typically developing people, the biggest trap we have in life is our Yetzir Hara, our evil inclination. And that is our disempowering self that God put in us. And it never tires of trying to get us to sit with toys and cry. That's what our lower self wants us to do. That's where it feels its power. And it uses all of its ingenuity and, and resources to get us down, to bring us to a scarcity mindset and make us feel like we cannot go on. Um, so um, it, it thinks of all the legitimate reasons that you know the horse manure is awful, right? And we should not, not be having fun here. It brings negativity to our life. This is our Yetzirah. And at every given moment, this is what we're battling. So it's, it's 
Now, now, once upon a time, we just assume these things, but now we know scientifically that our brains are wired to see things negatively because that's how we once upon a time protected ourselves. But we don't have to stay in that spot. We can look at it and say, thanks for that message, anxiety little you know, pet I have on my shoulder, but I don't need to stay there. I don't need to spiral down with that. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to develop a wider lens, right? So um, a lot of what the Torah says and a lot of the sources we're going to read here is actually was said hundreds of years ago, maybe even thousands of years ago, but today it's studied and put into like scientific protocol. And we don't have to assume these things anymore. Once upon a time, Torah told it to us, psychologists assumed it. Today we actually have the science, okay? So, um, so um, when we're in neutral and we're trying to get north of neutral, there is no ceiling. There's no ceiling for our joyfulness and our happiness. We can always be happier. Does that resonate? Like we can all, there's no ceiling to our happiness. That's really, it's really great to think about, right? And we do not need worry to problem solve. It's just a signal again to our brain that we should pay attention, that there is potential for something to go wrong, but usually what we worry about doesn't happen and something else happens. And then all we tell ourselves is, oh my God, I didn't worry enough and I didn't worry about that. But really we never needed that worry because worry gets in the way of problem solving. Worry brings us into our lower self and it puts us in a scarcity mindset. And then we're just repeating all of those self-fulfilling prophecies kind of for ourselves and we're not able to strategize and get out of that worry okay um you know i'll just you know we have this you you're you might be in a great place right and you're thinking positively and your yates are tov your higher self is there to guide you and then you have this little yeah but frog right yeah but I could have, uh, yeah, you know, look, you lost so much weight, you're in the middle of a pandemic, or wait, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you didn't gain any weight, yeah, but you could have been on a diet. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and you you kept your cool about, you know, what, what was going on in your house, yeah, but you didn't accomplish this. So we have this little, yeah, but frog, is what I've heard it referred to, that is, again, trying to just bring us down. Um, but we have the potential, and that's what we're going to talk about here, joy, happiness, to elevate our lives into, the, into our higher selves, which is then we're more directly connected to our infinite space, and then we're limitless, right? We have all this expansiveness in front of us because we do not need to struggle. Now, again, I'm not talking about chemical issues or mental health issues. I'm talking about on an average day, people that are just normally struggling in neutral. So um, we are both divine and we're human. And we're going to talk about the mindfulness that it takes to be present, to be able to do these things. So um, it behooves us to be able to address this topic again and again, and um, to fight for the ability to feel joyousness. Okay. So so far, any questions or comments, please um, unmute, your, uh, unmute yourself and share if you would like to. Okay. I have a question. Hi. Sure. It's Jody. Tom. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I was curious about your no limits to happiness. We can always get even more happy. I, I recall some Torah study where we don't want to have too much extremes, I think. And, you know, we want to somewhat have an even keel. Um, we don't want to be extreme. I guess, I mean, you don't want to go out. Maybe happiness is not an extreme. I mean, like where we would be insensitive, but then that it's not even happiness. Like, what would you mean? Like, it's even when someone dies, we're happy? No, ecstasy kind of a static kind of. Mania. Yeah, so I'm not, I, I don't think that's what I meant by, but, and that's also like maybe drug induced. Like, I mean, I think that there's no ceiling to happiness that you could produce within your own self. Inner joy, inner joy. Inner joy, yeah. 
yeah, that's kind of what I was referring to. Thank you. Okay, so um, I just want everybody, if you have a pen and paper, great, think about it in your head. You don't have to share this, but I want to take like a minute to think about what stands bet between you and happier you. Like if you wanted to up a notch of your normal happiness, your neutral or your ha or your north of neutral, what is standing between you and getting further? Okay, so there's something that is in between you and happier you. Is that, now I'm gonna name four factors that could be standing in the way, okay? Or, or the cause of, four factors that could be the cause of something standing in your way, okay? So is it, is what's standing between you and the happier you, is it something money can buy? Is it, does it involve a relationship? Is it something only God could provide for you? And D, it's something I have to do on my own. So is it money that's standing, that is contributing to what stands between you and a happier you? Is it about a relationship that is contributing to what's between you and a happier you? Is it something God could provide you? Or is it something you can do? And does anyone wanna share there a if it was a b c or d that is part of what's standing in their way go ahead dr maxi well for me it's d because what i've started noticing is my own internal dialogue the butt frogs and things like that and so i find that a lot of it has to do with my own mindset so what can i do given circumstances to maintain a level of happiness or to find at least a place of equanimity and peace. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to share? Jump I in. Think, well, for me, it's D, but I, I actually think D would be for any of them really, because if, if you need to, something money can buy you to be happy, then that's something wrong within you. I mean, that, that you have to work on to fix. And then if it's a relationship that you're dependent on to be happy, that goes back to you also. Okay. But what about like, you know, if I had a, a, um, a child, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, if I, then that's something only God could provide. So that's what's so standing between me and happy. Okay. Me so is to so be that's, that one's different, but, um, <laughs> Shut up, my husband's laughing but um but I think as far as money and relationships go that that if those are two things that would make you happier then it's it's worth looking into d more okay. thanks okay so now I want you for a minute to envision that blockade being knocked down so think of like that that doesn't exist, you know, whatever is between you and happier you disappears. And this is where we're trying to get to is growth in this area so that um, we are, a this is what this course is going, is hopefully going to help us come to is where whatever it is you wrote down there and whatever it is was standing in your way, we, you are envisioning like knocking through it. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is start with, I mean, we have started, but I'm gonna share a video if I can do this. So, let's see, um, and go. Can you hear it? In the film Annie Hall, Woody Allen suggests that happy people are shallow and empty. 
had no ideas and nothing interesting to say. Woody Allen may have been funny, but according to recent scientific studies, he was wrong. Research has shown that happy people show more flexibility and ingenuity in their thinking, are more productive in their jobs, are better leaders, and they even earn more money. A fascinating and now classic study demonstrates a link between happiness and longevity. The Nun study focused on 180 nuns who joined convents in Milwaukee and Baltimore between 1931 and 1943. On entering the convent, the nuns wrote an autobiography describing their lives and reasons for joining a religious order. Years later, researchers at Kentucky University analyzed these autobiographies. Based on the level of positive feeling expressed in each autobiography, the nuns were categorized into four groups, ranging from the happiest 25% to the least happy 25%. Research results showed that 90% of the most cheerful group were alive at age 85 versus 34% of the least cheerful group. 54% of the most cheerful group was alive at age 94, as opposed to 11% of the least cheerful group. Those who used many words expressing positive emotion lived on average over 10 years longer than those who used few such words. Research has also shown that being genuinely happy is an indicator for successful relationships. At the University of California at Berkeley, researchers studied 141 senior class photos of women from the 1960 yearbook of Mills College. They examined their smiles. Half of the women had genuine smiles, the so-called Duchenne smile, in which the corners of the mouth turn up and the skin around the eyes crinkled, and half the women had inauthentic smiles, known as the Pan-American smile, after the flight attendants in television ads for the now defunct heroine. The women were contacted at ages 27, 43, and 52, and asked about their marriages and their life satisfaction. It was found that on average, women who genuinely smiled in their photos were more likely to be married stay married, and experience more personal well-being over the next 30 years. Numerous studies indicate that happiness leads to success at work, better health, and good relationships. Why is this so? Why does happiness result in so many positive byproducts? What do you think? How many of you just went to check your yearbook? <laughs> See whether you're smiling. Okay, so we saw a lot of great data for why it's important to be happy. And I think that if you join this class, you're definitely in a search for to understand happiness and to um, figure out how to be happier. And again, this is not a this is not a, a lack of depression is happiness. Like there's something in between. We're all living in a normal world. We're living in a pandemic for goodness sake. So this is all, you know, very useful and practical. So who here is able to access um, the, the texts? Anybody? Okay. Um, Adira, would you like to read text one? I am going to screen share one second, text one for whoever would like to read it here. Oh, you guys can see my whole screen now, lovely. Okay, um, can you see it? Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, so text one, Adira, go ahead. Read it, yeah, go ahead. Is my mic on? What? I just wanna make sure my mic is on. Your mic is on. So let me just say one second, sorry, Adira. This is from the Tanya. The Tanya is the seminal book of Hasidic thought. It is, was written by the first Rebbe of Chabad in the um, 1700s. And um, the Tanya is filled with really practical tools for everyday living. There's a lot of extreme depth there, but the, the Alter Rebbe really um, 
it's kind of the um, it's it's very relatable and practical. And the Tanya is talking about what's going on in our inner world. Okay, and um, this text is really a springboard. It's one of the first texts of Tanya. It's a springboard for much of Tanya. It's like the clincher. Okay, and look what it is saying. Okay, this is like a really important book in Hasidic thought. And go ahead, you're up. Can you're can up. make the text larger? I cannot. Okay. You can do it on your own if you- Yeah, just open it on your phone bigger maybe. Okay. So this should be made known as a cardinal principle. The internal spiritual battle waged against one's negative impulses is similar to a physical wrestling match. Okay, let me just, let's just stop there for one second. So it's very, it's very interesting to note that the Alter Rebbe, who's talking in the 1700s, is giving an example to us about a wrestling match. Now in 2020, wrestling is pretty big, but I don't know what wrestling looked like back then, but it's, it's a very, you see how like, how human this is, this example is. Go ahead, Adira. Okay. Um, if two individuals are wrestling with one with each other, each striving to fell each uh, the other, but one is lazy and lethargic, he will fall and be easily defeated, even if he is stronger than his opponent. The same applies regarding the con the conquest of one's impulses. It is impossible to defeat them from a state of laziness and heaviness, which stem from sadness and a dull heart. They can be defeated only from a state of enthusiasm, which derives from, derives from happiness and a heart free of any trace of worry and sadness. Okay. So what the Alter Rebbe is saying here is that you can have two opponents and one can even be stronger than the other one. But who is going to win? The one who is, has a better attitude. The one who is filled with enthusiasm, the one who is lethargic is going to be lazy and he is going to be defeated. Okay, anybody have any thoughts on this? Is it kind of like the self-fulfilling prophecy situation where oh, I'm probably going to lose and then with that attitude, they don't even try and therefore they do lose? Or okay. is that a coincidence? Perhaps, or perhaps he very much wants to lose, but all he's thinking about is the fight. I mean, he very much wants to win, but he's only thinking about the fight he had with his wife that morning. So he's he really wants to win. He's all on it, but he's so bogged down with this pessimism and negativity and and just feeling so upset about his child's report card or or the the ticket he got on the way over or the way his coach spoke to him whatever it is it's, it's something it's not yeah something is is pulling somebody down so um anyone have any comments okay so um again this is going back to our yetzer hara and our yetzer tov our higher self which is our Yetzir Tov, our good inclination, and our Yetzir Hara, which is our lower self, our, our less good inclination. So Natch, or I'm sorry, are also our Nefesh Elokus, our, our godly soul, and our Nefesh Bahamas, which is our earthly soul. So that's really not the Yetzir Hara and the Yetzir Tov. I'm talking about our earthly, human, animal soul, which is our lower self, and we have our godly self, which is our higher expansive self. So our natural state of being our, from our reptilian brain, from the brain that we share with, you know, more than just ourselves, that our brain that we're born with and is under, is developed, it's fight or flight. It's the, it's the brain that keeps us surviving as a species that has a natural um, tendency for negativity bias. Yet, because we have a spiritual soul inside of us, because we have this higher self, we look for positivity in our lives. If you think about it, you know, people will spend so much money on therapy. People who are middle to lower income and they don't have a lot of money, you have people that are looking for happiness because 
or maybe they're not even going to therapy. That's actually a good thing, but maybe people are looking for happiness in all the wrong places, but people are consistently looking to better themselves, to better their lives because we care about it. it is we, we have an inclination to see negativity, but all of us are connected to our better selves and we all want positivity and happiness for ourselves. So um, what the what the Alter Rebbe is saying here has a lot of depth and a lot of nuance, and it, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it because I think you can think of it. You know how much how many of us are wrestling? Not many of us, but think of a job interview. Okay, two people can go in for a job interview, and one has the most gorgeous resume, and they're really qualified for the job, and they have every single talent and skill and tool available, and they just come into that that interview and there's no excitement, there's no exuberance, they're pretty, you know, their affect is pretty dull. And then somebody else comes in and their their resume is not necessarily so impressive, but they have so much enthusiasm for the job and they have this can-do spirit. Like, who do you think in 2020 is getting that job? Probably the person who has all the enthusiasm and the excitement and the can-do attitude is probably going to win over that job and, and probably should get that job because they care and they have passion and this is what they want to be doing. Um, and then take, take something else, for example. You know, let's say you have a, um, a friend or a child or a spouse and you see something in them that's really bugging you or they did something that's bothering you and you want to confront them. So our natural tendency is to make things heavy, right? It's heavy. It's important, let's talk about this. So we come with this sour face and this admonishing voice. And we think because what's going on is, is important, we need to make it heavy and important. But you've like lost the battle right when you started. I mean, we, we kind of know this today. Like if you come to somebody and you have a sour face and you're talking about the relationship, the person across from you is gonna be like, oh, there's no point here, it's, it's hopeless. I can't impress you ever, everything I do is wrong. And there's not gonna be much movement as opposed to if you come to your spouse or your child or your friend with love and acceptance and say, you know, I'm so blessed in this relationship and you're such a good friend to me. You're such a good husband to me. You're such a good child to me. And you're such a good parent to me. We have so much going, but you come with this like lightness and brightness and it's, it's counterintuitive. You're like making it into no big deal, right? And you're just making it the tiniest little poke. Like if you could just, you know, put down the toilet seat, I would just, you know, um, if you just make it really, really light, that is light. But if you, and you know what? You're gonna be successful because you are giving off this expansiveness and you are being light about it. So, um, this template that the Alta Rebbe and the Tanya is telling us about is a buoyancy template. It is the template where you have a better chance of winning. And this truth affects so much of our lives. Um, and we have this struggle between the lethargy and the heaviness and the depression and the anxiety. I mean, look at what's going on in society today. We have this struggle every day going on in our hearts and our minds. And life is that battle between my higher, expansive, lighthearted, um, uh, you know, seeing things from a broader prism and then my lower self, which is the self of scarcity and, and a fixed mindset and closeness and, and anxiety and fearful. It's that animal soul and that godly soul the, the egocentric soul, which is that soul that is pushing you down, and your godly soul, your idealistic soul. And many, many, many of our decisions are going to fall into these two categories. My egocentric self seems like you, it seems like it has your back. Like, this is me. This is the side of me that says, you know, you, you deserve that piece of cake. And, you know, that person spoke so not nicely to you. You should let them know how it is. And it seems like they have your back, but often it's, it's self-destructive. And, um, and then your idealistic soul is the voice that is, comes to really empower you. And it builds you up long-term, not in the moment. So um, this is the template for the best way to resonate. For your godly soul to resonate from within you. And that is to maintain this internal environment of joy. 
So for example, you start off your day, you wake up in the morning and you've exercised. You had the time to exercise and you ate this wonderful breakfast and you're feeling so empowered and you're feeling so great. And you're like, oh, why would I ever eat sugar? And why would I ever touch a carb again? I mean, I just had the best smoothie and the best workout and I'm doing great. And then you get like that phone call from work and the assignment, you know, the, 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 the thing that, um, the, um, performance that you did was, you know, rated wrong or the video didn't go through. And now you have to redo whatever it is. And bam, it's like, you deserve that diet Coke, even though you haven't been on diet Coke, cause it's not good for you. And why would you, and, and tell them what they deserve. And all of a sudden you are, you, the self-talk of the feeling of being able to make all those good choices. It's like in a puff of air just disappears from you. And all of a sudden you're tired, you're worn out, you're, you're more critical of yourself, you have self-doubt, you go straight for the sugar that you swore an hour ago you're never touching again because there was no reason to touch it again, right? And your lower self gains that upper hand in one moment and none of this makes sense to you. But it's this is reflective of how your higher self is trying to control the environment. But as soon as your anxiety, your sadness, your depression, your upset takes over, no longer can your higher self control the story, control the narrative anymore. It becomes, it like gets muffled that voice because your lower self voice, your egocentric voice is very loud that the voice that you had in the morning that was so good for you gets muffled and now your lower self is, is heard. It speaks up and it's excellent. It makes you feel like you want that sugar and you want to yell at your boss and you want it, you know, you, you want to do all those things that are not good for you. And this shows up for us in every facet of our life where we need to have discipline, impulse control, self-mastery, problem solving, mitzvot. This is the what's at play all the time is where are we feeling empowered in the moment? So joyfulness and happiness is the key to which part of us is going to be empowered in the moment and allow us to make those good choices. Um, your mind is in the ring, okay? This is, it's your happy thoughts, they're taking over, better choices, better you, more success, like that video said, you're going to live longer. All those things are going to work for you. But then the negativity sets in and you're disempowered. And, and ironically, it's not like you would think that if your mind's at play, maybe when my higher self gets lower, my lower self gets lower, but it's like a seesaw. As soon as your higher self goes down, your lower self, that is the, it's the same environment that muffles your higher self is the environment that produces this great energy for your egocentric self. And what we know scientifically today is that you cannot be in two places of your brain at the same time. So if you are in fight or flight, if you are in anxiety, if you are in fear, you cannot be critically thinking. And this is what the Tanya was telling us. So your your Yetzer Hara, your Nefesh Bahamas, your animal soul, it's fueled, it is fueled, it lives off of negativity. This is where addiction comes in and destructive behaviors come in. I'm not talking about addictive, like medically addictive. I'm just talking about the, you know, Netflix, shopping, gossiping, those kind of addictions that we get so much pleasure from. You know, we really, we, th those feed us, right? But that's not coming from an empowering place. That's coming from a real disempowering place. And it, your your high your higher self becomes disempowered from all of that um you know ugly stuff so you think of the pleasure of self-destruction like gossip politics doomsday conspiracy theories this feeds people i mean look what was going on in the last few months people were having they they were miserable they were enjoying their misery to no end and um that was all that egocentric self just feeding it, okay? Um, so being energized and empowered by darkness and sadness, every slight is illuminated when you're in this space and you enjoy that negativity. But we are, but, but, but today, 
we know we know better and we are going to try to move i think that awareness is really is really helpful to know like what's at play here when we're in both those places and people are obsessed with happiness today although there's a lot less happiness going on and the bottom line from the tanya is that happiness is baseline you need to baseline be happy to make good choices in your life is that is that does that resonate with you? Is that new to anyone that happiness is where you make good choices from? Like it's, it's not so much about self-control or willpower. It's happiness. Isn't that interesting? I found this really interesting. Okay. Any comments or questions? Um, is the Yetzirah and the animal soul are they one and the same or are they just two parts of of a, are they two parts of one side the yetsahara is your animal soul is can be neutral and then the yetsahara comes in and drags your animal soul down further so your your animal soul can in fact be neutral and the same with the other side, like the godly soul and the... The godly soul is not neutral because the godly soul is from God. Anyone else? Sherry, tell me something. Uh, well, let's see. So... Um, I mean, I, I agree with the concept of that, you know, when we're in a happy place or when we're at that baseline of happy that we can, we can oftentimes only go up because we're empowered to see what may be, be, what may be unhealthy around us as unhealthy and as something to, um, to change, to become happier. Does that make sense what I'm saying? To make cho better choices. Yes, yes, and um, um, I put you on the spot. You don't have to. You did because I was thinking, but I wasn't necessarily thinking and ready to go. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to. I, I really also think of this in terms of like when you're you're trying to motivate a child, a spouse, a friend, like if you just can't expect a, a good response from somebody if they're not happy. So it's a new kind of way to look at it and say like, am I going to get the best results in this conversation or at this moment? Because if somebody's not in a, a happy place, in a good place, they're not gonna make those decisions that are conducive to their self growth or to the environment. Okay, um, question. Do you think, um, think about this, is being happy a personal choice or a moral choice? Personal or moral? Yeah, personal or moral? Both. Both, okay. Why both? Because I'm the only one that can choose my disposition. And then the other is, is it's a moral choice from what you've already said, because if I am going to be able to not give in to my animal soul or not let my animal soul drag me down, and if I'm going to uh, be part of Tikkun Alam and help to make things better, then you've already put out the proposition that I need to be in a place of happiness to do that. So from that point of view, it's a moral choice. Okay, good, good, good. So, um, so our choice to be baseline happy, happier. Um, so first of all, we've already discussed that it's good for me, right? I want to do this because it's good for me. I'm going to get a better paying job. I'm going to be more successful in life. I'm going to live longer. All these things we know come from my own personal happiness. And then as Joy just, Dr. Maxi just said that the Torah perspective is that joy is, is, um, is the baseline for being able to make those moral and ethical choices, right? Because that happens when we're happy, we are able to choose, we're able to have self-mastery, right? So, um, so 
the Torah perspective is that joy and happiness is not only important, but it's a moral choice because we're impacting the world by this happiness. Like Dr. Maxi just says, we have tikkun olam. Now, this is not to make anybody feel guilty or being like, oh my God. So now my happiness doesn't just affect me. It doesn't just cause me to go for the sugar. It doesn't just affect my spouse or anyone I'm with. It also affects the entire world. So I'm not telling you this, we're not learning this to make you feel guilty, but to feel empowered and motivated and say like, wow, you mean my hard work on happiness is not just affecting me, it's actually affecting change in the entire world. And we're gonna learn some pretty awesome concepts about what happiness does in the world. So let's go to text two. Um, so once I open these texts, it's hard for me to see who's here. So um, whoever wants to read, somebody just read text two, please. I can read, Sandrine. Thank you. Sandrine, you were actually on my mind <laughs> to ask you to read, go for it. Great mind, think alike. Yes. The nature of joy is to breach barriers. That is, joy tends to break through the various limitation and restriction of the human character. When the faculties of a person first emerge from a state of potential, they each take a, a certain definition and shape. Human joy breaks through this default state. When we are joyous, we tap into and reveal the deeper but latent potential of our character and we are then empowered to behave in a different announced manner. Okay, so this is from the Rebbe Rashab in the 1800s. And what the Rebbe Rashab here is saying is that that joyfulness actually, it, it is transformative, okay? That it breaks through our limitations. So this is what we were speaking about. You come from a scarcity mindset to an expansive mindset. So you can have a certain potential in that is that is what you're living up to. But when we have joyousness and joyfulness, we like break down those barriers and we reveal something much deeper about ourselves. Does this it it like unleash unleashes our soul powers, joy? So you can so this is why there's no ceiling to joy, because the more joyous you are, the more the deeper you're going to get inside of your soul. And, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive where you would think the more serious and brooding and thinking and deep and introspective, oh, that's going to bring out all of this great stuff, all the marrow from within my bones. But what, um, what Torah is telling us here, what Hasidus, what, what deep Hasidic thought is telling us is that no, 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 it is joy. It is joy that brings out the best in you. Does that resonate with you? Okay, so the next text three, um, Sherry, do you wanna read text three? So this is, wait, I just, before you say, this is from the Zohar. The Zohar is the prime seminal work of Kabbalah itself. This is Rabbi, um, this is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's writings. Like this is when the, the secrets of the Torah got revealed through the Zohar. So listen to what the Zohar says. Come and observe. Our world is always ready to receive the spiritual flow that emanates from above. The upper world provides in accordance with the state below. If the state below is joyous, abundance flows from above. But if the state below is one of sadness, the flow of blessing is constricted. Therefore, serve God with joy. Psalms 100. What? Psalms 100. Psalms 100. Okay. So this is this is pretty heavy stuff. So first of all, back to just um the other the other um one was that happiness engages us to be successful. And then the next thing we're saying here is that not only that, but um happiness affects cosmic change. What the 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 deep secrets of the Torah is telling us is that. It is a mirror that how we, God wants to give blessings to us. So he gives us blessing, but when we're joyous, he gives us more blessings. That is pretty awesome to consider. Um, you know, 
is this hard? So maybe that's why it's so hard. You know, you don't, it, it, you don't get something that's so valuable by, you know, not hard work. Here we have all this hard work and we're fighting the good fight for the joy. And look at that. It's actually really, really, really beneficial. And it's a lot comes out of this. So, um, so, um, okay. So now we have, um, one, actually not one more text, but, um, okay. Any, any comments on what we've spoken about so far? You know, that text number three becomes really interesting when we think about 2020, because it makes you wonder where our happiness and joy is right now. And more maybe where we needed a reset based on from below, if we're a state of sadness, our blessings are constricted. So I'm sure many feel like because it's been so difficult and so many hard and bad things have happened this year that we have to reevaluate our happiness. And we've been challenged, you know, before 2020, we were blissfully going about our lives and maybe happiness externally or, or maybe happiness was e easier to come by. And I mean, 2020 has been the great equalizer. So everybody was challenged here. Everybody has to find inner happiness. So perhaps, as you say, in 2020, during this pandemic, we are all being given the opportunity to dig deep. And that's very profound happiness because we're not getting happy from concerts and we're not getting happy from movie theaters or Broadway or baseball or basketball. So many of the things that were making us happy, travel, um, seeing our family, seeing relatives, all those things are not really here for us. And we're having to intrinsically find happiness. That's really kind of cool, right? Because we can awaken this great, greater happy, a greater blessing perhaps from above is, is how I see it. But if anyone else sees it differently, let me know. Few, fewer distractions uh, force us to go further and more deeply within. And to me, that's, that's what the pandemic has done. It stopped us in our tracks. I mean, it's it clearly, it benefits everyone to be happy because you're more skillful. You, you relate more skillfully to everything in your life and to, and to the world around you. But it's always an inside job, you know? That, it, yeah, it's, it, to me, it's, it's, it, it always has to come from inside, which to begin with, it helps to know what really makes you happy. You know, it may not be the new car, you know? <laughs> right. Anyway, that's all I want yes. to say. Yes, it's it's our internal environment that we're discussing here. That's I'm just that's wondering, like, at what levels to though isolation and stuff like this doesn't affect people, even if you are can find joy. At what point is it just brain activity, and that you're actually, you know, it's like mental illness that you're depressed. I, Yes. And then if you find happiness in that, how much greater is your happiness? Again, it's like right. a challenge. We're being called. Maybe that's what this whole thing is about. Maybe this is all about being called to find happiness, to find joy with everything ripped away from us. Um, you know, and thank God we have food on the table. So, um, Julie, do you, so um, let's, so actually, Danielle, this kind of segues into our next text, which is, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, during pandemic, are we happier people? Have we been happier people? I know all of us think we were, maybe, no, not all of us, I won't assume anything. Did we think we were happier pre-pandemic? So Julie, do you wanna read text five? It's gonna go up on the screen in a second. Sure. Um, okay, go ahead, text five. Okay. Um, <clears throat> In the United States, rates of depression are 10 times higher today than they were in the 1960s, and the average age for the onset of depression is 14 and a half compared to 29 and a half in 1960. A study conducted in American colleges tells us that nearly 45% of students were so depressed that they had difficulty functioning. Other countries are following in the footsteps of the United States. In 1957, 52% in Britain said that they were very happy compared to 36% in 2005. Despite over the last half century, oh, sorry, 
I messed up. Despite the fact that the British have tripled their wealth over the last half century. With the rapid growth in the Chinese economy comes a rapid growth in the number of adults and children who experience anxiety and depression. According to the Chinese health ministry, the mental health status of our country's children and youth is indeed worrying. While levels of material prosperity are on the rise, so are levels of depression. Even though our generation in most Western countries, as well as um, an increasing number of places in the East is wealthier than previous generations, we are not happier for it. A leading scholar in the field of positive psychology, just whoa, whatever, that's a name. Yeah. <laughs> Um, ask a simple question with a complex answer. If we are so rich, why aren't we happy? Okay, so I think this really um, speaks to a lot of what we were just talking about, which is pandemic, no pandemic. Clearly, life circumstances cannot be the defining factor for happiness. So it's not being at home alone in the pandemic. And it's not pre-pandemic when we had everything going for us. That is not what defines personal happiness. What then is the defining factor of happiness in the Jewish tradition? Okay, so pre-pandemic, post-1960s, we're wealthier, we are not happier. We're in the pandemic and our circumstances have changed some of us are actually happier, by the way, and some of us are status quo, and some of us are unhappy. Okay, so um, there is a theory. There is this idea of being attached to our, you know, being attached to our earthly desires or attached to our materialistic things, and that attachment it comes with sort of a fear of losing it, which gives you that anxiety. But if you were to detach yourself from those those wants and des and those the the earthly desires, you could find that freedom and thus kind of find that inner happiness. It's it's a philosophy that maybe the Torah is is not about. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing, but it is a philosophy. I believe like the Eastern um, mindset, like the Buddhist. I think I don't know if it's a Torah concept, but it doesn't sound too bad. Okay, so um, thanks, Adira. And actually, it's um, it's not really. Uh, it's Torah doesn't promote asceticism. Is that the word? Where you remove yourself from the world and remove yourself from worldly pleasures and sit on a mountaintop and hum and be one with God. That's not the. That is not the Jewish way to find happiness. I'll just. We'll, but we'll, we'll. But we'll talk about how. You know, but things don't either make us happy, right? So there's got to be something else. So um, there is a there is a um, a thing. It's a movement, and it's called the hedonic treadmill. Okay. So um, if we are so rich, why aren't we happy? Why is it that having more doesn't automatically result in more happiness? And let's read text seven and um, text seven. Um, Susan Crone, do you want to read text seven? This is from the um, Chovot Halavavot, and this Chovot Halavavot, if anyone is interested in studying this, there's Rabbi Shays Taub has a podcast on this, and this is um, a book written in the 11th century, and it deals with issues of faith and um, trust. And it is, I've been reading it and learning it over the pandemic because all of us kind of need to strengthen our faith and our trust with what's going on in the world right now. And it is fascinating. So um, this is, this was originally published in 1080 and it was published in Hebrew and then translated. And it's really, um, it's really a fascinating take on um, the Jewish thoughts in faith and trust. So Susan, do you want to read the parable, please? Sure. A parable. There was once an infant found in the desert by a kind-hearted individual. This benevolent person took pity on the child, carried him home, brought him up, fed him, clothed him, and provided him generously with all that was good until the child was old enough to understand and comprehend the many benefits he had received. 
The same benefactor heard of someone who had fallen into the hands of his enemy and had for a long time been treated with extreme cruelty, starved and kept naked. The benevolent person appeased the enemy and convinced him to free the prisoner and forgive his debt. The kind individual brought the man to his home, but the kindness provided to this man was a fraction of the kindness shown to the infant. Okay, so first of all, the parable is giving us, there's one very um, benevolent person and he does two kindnesses. One is a kindness that's lifelong. He raises this infant, he clothes him, he takes care of him, he nurtures him, he raises him into a functional human being. The second thing that he does is he, in one moment, he sees somebody being mistreated, abused, and he convinces he doesn't use any of his money, he doesn't use any of his power, he just uses his word, I mean, he uses his, his power of words, he doesn't even garner a favor, he just says, you know, he convinces them to take him out, and he frees the prisoner, and he convinces the, the, the prisonee the, to forgive the debt. So the question is, which of the rescued individuals will be more appreciative and why? Ariella. I, I would think certainly the second one, because even though it, 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 it appears that less, fewer activities maybe were done for this person or in a shorter time span, but uh, the second person the beneficiary of this, he, you know, he knew what it was like to be treated cruelly and starved and, and this infant never knew anything different. Exactly. That is exactly the point. The point is, is that even though much more was put into the infant and much more resources, energy, time, love, connection was put into the infant, the infant was able, not saying he didn't appreciate it, but there was so much he didn't even know and he's able to take it for granted. Whereas the adult knew exactly what was going on in his life. He probably, he might've even once lived a very nice life. It was taken from him and then given back from him. So surely he is going to be more appreciative. And the Chobos Halavavos is giving us this parable. Why? It's to tell us this is exactly how we live our lives. We are like the infant. We are born into this world. We are born into a, we're born. Number one, we are given life. We are given everything. We are given the faculties to function in life. We're hopefully given parents. We're given blue skies. We're given green grass. We're given nature. We're given re resources, whatever it is we're given. And we can never even like imagine not having them because we're given them. So this is how we come to take things for granted. And this is why people today can have so much more than they had before, yet somehow we are not happier because we are born into this society. We have no smallpox, we have no polio, we have COVID, but we don't have, and, and even COVID, like I was sitting, I had a, um, uh, my, annual breast examination, which was supposed to happen in March. So <laughs> it was pushed off until much, much later. And I was sitting with a mask in the office, you know, in that little roby thing and you're naked and it's the most solitary um, experience ever. And, and we were all sitting in, and it's solitary even when we're not in masks, no babies being born. You're like there to check your breasts. Like nobody's excited for you. And, and then I was like, Hey everybody, I just, I, I'm not even that friendly. And I was just like, I, I, something inside of me just wanted to, and we all ended up moving into the same waiting room. And a woman next to me told me that her dad was in a, a polio machine for eight years of her life. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like we are complaining about being quarantined in our homes and he was in this machine with his head and his body for eight, maybe her entire childhood, I don't know, but it just really gave me perspective. So um, we live where it's normal to have running water, computers, robots, everything. And, and it all fails to excite us. Like we, we, it doesn't make us happy because, but 
but the novel things we gain later in life and we have a little more wisdom, those are ironically the things that we really attach a lot of joy from. So um, the next text is, um, Charna, do you wanna read the next text? Yes, okay, number eight. Yes. Yeah. All right, we don't manage to leave this world with even half of our desires fulfilled. When we have 100, when we have 100, we want to turn it into 200. When we have 200, we want to make it, make of it 400. Okay, so, so again, like we're, we're, this is ingrained in us, a good thing, right? We're strivers, we're not satisfied with the status quo. So again, it's that thing that works for us and against us. It works for us because we're constantly learning new ways to purify water and to make things easier and to come up with new medications. So that's the striving in all of us. But the striving in all of us is also that thing that makes us at times, more than at times, often unsatisfied. So how do we break the bank? How do we, what is, what do we do in between this taking for granted, the things that we have, um, not feeling satisfied, and it's a good thing not to be satisfied, but we want to be happy. So what is in between all of this? Wait, didn't the Rebbe um, have that attitude of never be happy yeah. where you are? Yes, right. exactly. exactly. My thought too. So like I said, it's a good thing. We're never supposed to be satisfied, yet we want to be happy. So where is, what comes in? What's the fix? What is the thing that lets us have our cake and eat it too. Gratitude. Dina, um, yeah. do we have a definition of happiness? Like a few sentences? Do we have a definition of happiness? Yes. Happiness is um, north of neutral. <laughs> that makes sense. It's north of neutral. Okay, so as... Um, Dr. Maxey said, it is the habit of gratitude. It is the mindfulness. It's the ability to recognize what we have. Now, if you came to this class thinking like I was going to shatter the earth, I'm not going to shatter the earth because, but it is, it's, it's going from that point in the day where you're doing really well, and then you get a ticket. And that can send you into a spiral. And it is the practice of gratitude that helps you take a deep breath, stop and say, let's put this in perspective. I have a car, I have a car with gas that I could speed in my car. My car's so cool and so good that it allows me to speed. There are cops on the street they have not yet been defunded. No, I'm joking. They, there are cops on the street keeping me safe and they caught me speeding. So I am grateful that they could have, maybe they would have caught somebody who's really out of control driving and that would have been dangerous and that's gonna save a life. There are so many places we can go with gratitude, but it is transforming. It's happiness is, it's, it's a game changer, but it's not changing that much about our lives. It is the ability to stop and recognize what we do have. So, um, time is it? Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna finish up here. So um, so what is this attitude of gratitude? Where does this come from? It is <coughs> the simplest way to set your your foot yourself on the right foot every day and to be mindful. So I was speaking to my friend and she said to me, 12 seconds. If you think about something for 12 seconds, it can become a habit that you that takes it from short-term memory to long-term memory. So that's what we want to do here, right? We want to take the good in our life from short-term memory to long-term memory. We want to remember that we actually have a good life. So my friend was saying to me that when she has to take her medicine at night, her pills, whatever, she says, she's like 12 seconds. She doesn't remember if she did it. So she's like, brushing my teeth. I took off my glasses, my contact lenses, da, da, da. So I said to her, my problem is I don't even remember 
that I need 12 seconds. I pop it and I'm not even mindful or cognizant that I need to have those 12 seconds. So that's the essence of what we're gonna walk away from this class is how do we stop and take a moment to be mindful that we need to be mindful, that we need to be present, that we need to be grateful so that we can be happy, so that we can make good choices, so that we can be successful, so that we can live in an expansive way and we can reveal our true potential. Did everyone catch that? Okay, so how do we do this? So some of us, you know, if you go to a therapist or you go to a, a, a positivity coach, they're gonna tell you to start a gratitude journal. And gratitude journaling is brilliant. It's good for a lot of people. It is something that I don't think you would ever regret because if nothing else, you will one day look back at it and say, oh my goodness, I had so much going on or look, look what I was grateful for. Or, I wanna get back into that or I didn't know that person was in my life. I should get back in touch. I mean, there could be nothing wrong with journaling your life, right? If, whether it be you know five seconds a night, 10 seconds a night, one minute a night, a gratitude journal. But pre, pre, pre-date the gra gratitude journal, we have a morning prayer that we say literally, I know there's a meme like when I get up in the morning, the, the world is saying, um, oh crap, she's up or whatever it is. Like, um, so before you step that foot off your bed in the morning, you put your hands together and you say, I thank you living and eternal King for mercifully restoring my soul within me. Your faithfulness is great. So God's faithfulness in me, in giving me back my soul, the most basic thing in the morning is to start your day with the mo de ami, with this gratitude of I have woken up, my neshama was returned to me. It is a new day. I can do things differently today. I'm given a new chance. If you woke up today, that means you have something to accomplish. It means you matter. It means that you were taken into account. It is not by default that you woke up. It's not because somebody didn't notice or there's a certain amount of people that die every year and you weren't one of them. It is intentional. So being connected to that intention and breathing in that intention and recognizing that intention. That And, and let me tell you, I say moda'ani every day because it's a habit but I don't have the intention every day that needs to be behind the Modani. And taking this class with all of you is reminding me that I need to have that intention and remind myself what is going well in my life. And again, you know, it took me a while to connect with this class because I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm a, I'm a generally happy person. I don't, I don't have, I don't suffer from, from sadness or depression, you know, at least in my more mature years, you know, when I was younger, I think that was, you know, I had a lot of little kids and trying to figure out my place in life and things annoyed me more quickly. And, you know, I would get irritated more and, and, and not understand, but, um, and I, and I had a harder time connecting with the gratitude because it was like, you're so lucky you have kids. I'm like, really three of them in five years. So lucky, but you know, but really I am lucky, you know, but it was, it, it was like the flip side of being unlucky, right? It was too lucky. And, and that was that, that could be hard, but, um, it's, it's really the, it's, it's simple. And like all things that are very profound in life, it is being able to look at, um, we used to do this thing in preschool, you know, kids, we ask them what they're grateful for. And you, you get my, my new toy and my grandmother and my, and, and, and my bed and my blanket. And you get all the typical things kids are grateful for breakfast this morning. And we try to like really dig with the kids. We're like, hmm, my elbow. I'm so grateful for my elbows. You know, we tried as the teachers to like, to dig a little deeper with these kids so that they would find other things that are not obvious so that when they're, when mommy is not making them happy or grandma didn't come to town or buy them the present they wanted, they could find gratitude in other ways. So that is really um, the, the crux of the course. I think you should have some more reading. There was a lot of great articles at the end, but this is where I am turning it over to you and um, giving you, I hope I left you with one tool and something to think about the um, taking things from our short-term memory to long-term memory so that we can have, we could be at neutral 
so that we could make good choices, we can have self-mastery, we can be more successful, we can be more expansive, we can have more blessing in our life. All of this is connected to happiness. Who knew? Questions, comments? This is really a cliche, but we need to stop and smell the roses. <laughs> stop and smell the flowers. I don't grab that. them because they got right. thorns. <laughs> well, that's negative. <laughs> nope, just cautious so you can enjoy it. <laughs> Actually, Don, I told my husband, it better say on my tombstone, she stopped and smelled the flowers. Cause I'm always stop. That's one thing I do, stop and smell the flowers. <laughs> Thank you all for joining. Um, and next class will be, again, I said each class is its own class. Like you could take something from each class, but we're gonna build on more tools for gratitude, more tools for, tools for joyfulness. But the next class is journey of yourself, staying honest, humble, and happy, staying positive about life means staying positive about ourselves. And um, Leah's teaching it. And yes, and um, the date is, when's the date? I guess in a month. It's, um, it's Monday, December 21st. Okay. So, um, and tell your friends because more, you know, more, you can join even without the first class. You can join in the second class. Dina? Yes. Um, I, was, I was a participant in that Daughter of Hamas presentation and someone asked her how she survived all that abuse and negativity. And she said, I, I wanted to keep my promise to myself to be happy. Mm. So now we know to, when it's hard to, to have gratitude, to think of, to smell the flowers, to think of the things that we have in our life that can um, muster up that feeling of happiness. I have to say something. This is Susan Roseman. Hi, Susan. When things get, when you, you get like one thing after another, after another, what I think is very helpful is to realize, hey, things can only start to get better. Life is never all one way. There are times when things are excellent. There are times when things are not. But when they're not, you're going to be a lot closer to when things get good again. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of something that helps me. Plus, I really do believe that God is with each one of us, that God walks with us, that he's there, that he listens. And, you know, that's a comfort. If you have to go through some hard times, you're not alone. So that's my little thing uh, right now. And I really, I'm speaking from what I am living. I really am. There just have been some things that are just unbelievably sort of downers. However, I use these things. Yes, am I grateful for a lot of things? There are wonderful things to be grateful for. We're breathing. I mean, they're just, are, just in the simplest level. There are, there are really good things. But you know, life is kind of up and down. And again, if you realize if it's a down period, you're going to be closer to the up period before long. So that's my little business. My Thank little you, Susan. Thank right you for now. sharing. There's a great... Also, when things get bad and you're in a bad thing, where a bad sort of period where one thing after another after another... I mean, I actually had something happen today after lots of little things that were not exactly positive. And when it happened right before this show, this show, this uh, class, I just started to laugh. 
I just thought it was funny, you know, because I don't know, because that's life. It goes up and down. Susan, can I tell you a story that really res that's that that if, if whoever wants to leave can leave. But um, I told the story on the Eli talk that I did. There was a it's uh, to tell the story short. There was a chassid, uh, there was a, a man, his name is Moshe, and he was traveling to Leipzig and he had a suitcase and he had all his money in his suitcase because he was going to go make purchases. And with those purchases, he was going to sell stuff and make profit. And as he's traveling with his accountant and his box of all his cash, he's in the forest and he realizes he lost all the money. They lost the entire box with the cash. So he sends Aaron back to their last camping spot and he waits a day's travel and he hits the next day and Aaron comes back and he has this box with him. He's like, you're not gonna believe it. Every red cent is in this box. So Moshe, opens the box, he counts everything, he takes half of it, he gives it to his accountant, he says, leave, you're fired. So his accountant, Aaron, is like, are you kidding me? You're firing me? I found, I went back to, to our last camping spot. I found the box, all the money was in it. Let's go to Leipzig, let's go make more money. He said, you are fired. So um, he goes to Leipzig, Moshe, and he orders what he orders, but nothing comes on time, nothing sells. He's, all his money is gone and he is destitute. You know, they, it was cash only business 300 years ago and he is destitute. So he comes to a town and what he knows, what he's living off of is being invited to people's homes in this town. He's, he's completely destitute. He shows up at where he's going to be staying and the woman of the house says, you know, my husband's showering and then he's going to go to Shul. So he'll meet you after Shul back at the house. We're going to eat. But if you want, you can go to the bathhouse and take a shower before Shabbos. So, um, this guy who used to have this big suitcase of money is very poor. He goes into the shower, goes into the mikveh, he comes out and his clothing are gone. So now not only is he destitute, he's naked, he has nothing. And meanwhile, back at the house, the, the guy who says to his wife, where's our guest? He said, I, she said, I don't know. He didn't show up at Shul. I sent him to the mikveh. He comes to the mikveh and he sees a naked man dancing in the mikveh. And he comes and he says, sir, you're supposed to be my guest. What are you doing dancing naked in the mikvah? So, um, so here, let me give you some clothing. He throws his coat on him. They go home, takes him to his house. He freshens him up. He gives him, you know, he gives him clothing. They're sitting down to the meal and he looks at his guest. So his guest looks at him and he says, Aaron, you don't recognize me, huh? I recognize you. He says, who are you? He says, I was your boss. I was Moshe. He's like, what? He's like, so you need to answer some questions for me that day. You cry, you, you sent me away, you were so upset like it was Tisha B'Av. And tonight you lost all your clothing and you're dancing in the mikvah like it's, it's, it's some chas Torah. Explain, I, I don't understand this, Who, what, what's going on here? So he says, ah, he said that day in Leipzig, before Leipzig, when you found all my money, we were at the top of, the, of that wheel and I knew I have all my money, I lost it, I found it. I have one place to go and that's down. So I didn't want you to fall with me. I gave you half my money and I sent you on your way. He said, tonight when I went to the mikvah and I came out and not even my clothing was left, he's like, I knew I was at the bottom and I had nowhere to go anymore, but up. So that's why I was dancing. That's your story, Rosa, Susan. Absolutely, brava. There's a quote from a show I watched that has kept me going when I'm feeling really down. And it's an animated show. It's a kid's show. But there's so much Torah in it if you if you look, if you see it. And the quote that I've been living, that I've been reminding myself, but I have to do it every day, maybe twice a day, is you must never give in to despair. Allow yourself to slip down that road and you surrender to your lowest instincts. In the darkest times, hope is something you give yourself. That is the meaning of inner strength. And if you stop and think about it, if I give in to despair, I surrender to my lowest instincts, why would I want to be a person who surrenders to that lowest instincts? What is it, the um, Nefesh Bahamas, right? 
um, probably pronouncing it wrong, but the, the animal soul where it's all about me, it's all about survival, but it's not about living and, and thriving and growing and helping others. Why would I want to sink so low? So I can't let myself feel despair. I have to give, remind myself that there is hope, that there is light, that there is love and beauty in the world. And as long as I remember that quote from this child show, I think I've been able to get through some hardships and hard times that I've been dealing with lately. And I know it sounds very immature for me to say it, but I think there might be some wisdom there too. Thank you, Adira. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to close the class, Yari. Yeah, I think I'll just mention this. So thank you, Dina. Thank you all for joining. I just want to mention one thing. I'll let Dina close it out formally, but just very quickly, like I mentioned, for those of you that didn't yet pick up the gift bags, we have it. We got the wine glass, the custom wine glass. We have the wine. We have the bag. Everything's ready for you. Just be in touch. We'll coordinate details. If you just signed up for tonight's class and want to join the rest of the course, um, which I hope you do want to because it's amazing. Really, it's, ama it's an amazing course, as you saw tonight. Um, just reach out to me and we'll hook you up with uh, using whatever you paid for tonight and rolling it into uh, to the rest of the course. So hope you'll join and, and we'll see you, I'm sure, before then, but also on December 21st for the next session. And Dina, any final words? No, I just want to thank everyone for coming. This was so enjoyable and I really appreciate when you participate and tell your friends and come again. Thank Good night. you, Dina. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Lila Tove.